everyone to the second module of our course. In this module we are going to learn to time travel. It's a lot of fun and in Italy you can do it everywhere. There's so much. So why are we doing this? Rome is nothing but a beautiful container but it's just the container whereas we want to see the life of its people. So Unless you know those stories, just seeing the palaces, the squares, the fountains will not do much for you. I have been on so many trips with my parents where they pulled out the guidebook and read me what was there and it was just so dull and boring. So we are going to make it fun. How are we going to do that? Finding out how the people lived and trying to get you to imagine to be one of those people. So let's have a look. Why are we going to time travel? Normally what you see is what you get, but not in Rome. You get so much more. You can harness the power and the ghosts of the past and have a much richer experience. So that's what you want to do. You want to pull out all of the stories of all the people who have been there before you and that is going to enrich your experience no end. It's easy and it's fun. So you can quickly piece together the story of the place, even just using Google Images. You have to look for old pictures, paintings and prints, and those will give you a sense of the story of the place. Or you can just follow my courses. You can sit on a bench and you have to play pretend and put yourself in the shoes of the main players who have rejoiced, suffered and made history in that particular location you're at. Let's see how it's done. We'll go through two examples. One is Piazza Navona in this video and one is in and around Piazza Venezia in the next video. So today, if you have never seen one of these videos, my name is Maria Cristina Saraceno, I'm your Roman Consul. You can call me MC for short. We are going to have a look at Piazza Navona. So we're going to bring the ghosts of the past back to life. Let's have a look. This is Piazza Navona. Have you been there already? You might have. It's one of the most popular piazzas of Roma. And when you go there, if you've never been, you will not miss it. So what can you do there? You can have an ice cream or an aperitivo. You can take pictures, lots of them and selfies, and that's what people normally do. You can buy a painting because there's lots of uh, sellers um, on the square and also have a caricature done, which is fun. You can read a book and watch people go by at sitting in one of the cafes. The whole piazza is lined with cafes. It's beautiful, but you will well and truly just be an outsider, one of the many tourists that go through Rome and zip through and go off and they think, they have done Rome. That's not what you want to do. You want to truly enjoy the place. So let's make it an unforgettable experience for the next time you go. If you happen to go at Christmas, this is what you will find. You'll find a big Christmas market, which is not a Christmas market. It's an epiphany market. It's a market for La Befana. La Befana is an old lady who brings presents on the day of the Epiphany. Lollies, if you've been good, if you've been bad, she'll actually bring coal. So all of these stalls that you can see, they all sell Befane or um, sugary coal or um, nativity scenes. So this is the Befana. And she's an old lady. What's the story? There were the three kings and they, on the way to baby Jesus, they stopped at the home of La Befana. She was old and unfortunately her husband had passed away and also a small child had passed away. So she was really, really sad and uh, she was grieving so much. She was always locked up in her house, cleaning, cleaning with her broom. So the three kings thanked her for her hospitality and told her why don't you come with us come with us we're going to see the Lord 
and she said oh no, no no I have to clean my place I'm so sad I have to clean my place and and they left but after a few days the Befana thought you know what I should really go if that is God I need to go and uh, um, pay my respect and so off she went and she arrived with the three kings although she's never spoken about in other countries um, to see baby Jesus on the Epiphany and on that day baby Jesus because he saw her so sad because her son had passed away told her that from that day on all of the children would be her children and she could bring presents and lollies to all of them and so from that day on in Italy on the 6th of January La Befana brings presents you might find lollies, toys, toys or a coal. Now that's sugar coal if you're being naughty. And so on the fifth night, everybody hangs out their stockings. Stockings are not for Christmas in Italy, stockings are for La Befana. And that's a lot of fun. So Piazza Navona is definitely a place to go around Christmas. Although in the last few, in the last two years, uh, there have been lots of uh, uh, arguments about it. It might be now a thing of the past of this market because uh, the city council does not want just imported Chinese plastic things are sold at the market. They would like um, wooden carvings of the nativity scenes uh, and uh, Italian artisanal um, goods sold there. So since we are thinking about Christmas who brings presents in Italy? Depends where you live because there's lots of people who bring you presents. In fact my children do all of them. So on December the 6th it's St Nicholas which is the original Santa Claus. I'm not sure why Santa Claus is celebrated on the 25th of December in many countries but his celebration is normally on the 6th of December and that's just in some of the regions of Italy. Another one that I always used to love when I was a kid and now my children love, which is also a Northern European tradition, it's uh, St. Lucy, Santa Lucia. My children have thought for a long time, one of my children has thought for a long time, Allegra, that Santa Lucia, like Santa Claus, is a boy. But no, she's a girl and she's the patron saint of high eyesight and the light. Um, we can go and talk about Santa Lucia another time. Then on the 25th, it's not so much Santa Claus, but it's either Father Christmas, which is Babbo Natale, or Baby Jesus, which is uh, Baby Jesus. And then on January the 6th, La Befana. So December and January, big time for kids in Italy. Now, if you only stop at that, you will miss so much. And so we're going to have a look. I want you to think that you are on a bench in Piazza Navona and you are going to pretend to be all of these characters. So this is the piazza. As you can see, it's not a piazza any longer. It's a flooded lake. From the 1600s to the late 1800s, Rome is so hot during the summer that what they used to do, which was a really clever idea, um, well, it started because Piazza Navona is very close to the River Tiber. So, very often, um, until the, the, the banks of the Tiber have been reinforced at the end of the 1800s, uh, the piazza used to be flooded by the river. And so, the lady of the square, Don Olimpia, that we are going to meet soon, thought, ah, oh, that's a splendid idea to do in summer when it's so hot. We could just have a big pool. And so they didn't have a pool at the time, but um, she decided that every Sunday during um, August or during the whole summer, they would just block the, um, the uh, uh, drains of the fountain and um, they would just let the fountains flood. So this would become a summer lake and kids would come from all over the place just to play in the water. But not only kids, this was a much louder tradition that ended in a, 
the late 1800s after the people from Turin um, conquered Rome and they made it from concave to convex and then it was not possible any longer to have a summer lake. But imagine having a kid and escaping the heat, the heat and playing in the artificial lake. That was just so much fun. But it was not just fun for kids. As you can see in this painting, this is 1756. They used to, to everybody used to love it, especially the noble, rich people. And so you can see all of their carriages and they were going there to see everybody else and be seen, which is a huge part of Italian life. Um, so you would just go there at certain times of the day and uh, it would be a big social gathering, big social do. Imagine being a nobleman or a noblewoman coming here to see and be seen, to show off and gossip. Can you imagine that? Now, this is 1699, and as you can see on the square, there used to be a market. On some days it was quite more bustling than this, but this will give you an idea of the market of fruits and veggies. There were some um, uh, clothes stalls and uh, some book stalls, but lots of shops where you now find the cafes and lots of stalls too. So imagine here coming to sell your fruit and veggies. It's, it was a good place because everybody went to the center of Rome. This is 1634 and this refers to my background I suspect. So my surname is the Saraceno. This used to be the Saracen Joust. So just like in the Middle Ages in many countries uh, there used to be these jousting games and uh, there used to be a, a, a dummy. So you would be like a knight with lance in rest against the dummy of the Saracen and to the dummy of the Saracen was a holding a cat of nine tails. You could also imagine being a dame supporting a lover from the stands. Or you could imagine being the author of a theatrical scene or the poorer spectators on the roof of the houses around the square. Why do I say the authors of the theatrical scene? Because if you look at it, uh, there is lots of bleaches around the piazza, but they're made of wood. So that was all just made for that particular Saracen joust. And uh, you can, as you can see at the bottom of the picture, you can see a, a, a carriage, a float, uh, done up as uh, a, a beautiful ship and that was part of the games and it was fun. So who changed the piazza from a medieval one to a modern one? In fact if you have a look at this picture it's going to be interesting because if you've been there you know this already if you haven't I'm gonna tell you now in the middle of the square there is a huge massive big fountain with a big obelisk on top and if you look at this picture, there is no obelisk, there is no fountain. So, so who actually made it from that piazza into the modern one? And this is who? Donna Olimpia. She was, uh, let's say, the queen of the piazza. So when we're talking about Donna Olimpia, I want you to read the story in the downloads of the previous module. I hope you've read it so you'll have a very good idea of who she was and what she did. But it's a, she had a really fun, interesting life. She was a shrewd, wealthy, resourceful and power-thirsty woman. She was a, the financer and a counsellor to her brother-in-law throughout his career. Who was her brother-in-law? Her brother-in-law was a pope. So throughout her, the stages of his career, she financed his career and his postings abroad to Naples to, as Nuncius, so as ambassador, and uh, to Madrid as ambassador. She, Don Olimpia, became a princess and a counsellor of the Pope as her sister-in-law. Sister in and in the end, she, she had a massive success, but in the end, she had to leave Rome under the next pope 
and died of a plague in her principality. This was in the early first half of the 1600s. And this was her brother-in-law, the Pope Innocent X. We'll talk more about him in a minute. So when she um, married into the Pamphili family, they had some houses, medieval houses, on Piazza Navona. But they were not, they were Marquis, um, the, the family she married into, the Pamphili. She was quite wealthy herself. She was in a second marriage with the Pamphili. And uh, she decided that she needed to have a house fit for a cardinal at first and then for a pope. So little by little, she bought all of the little houses around her place. And uh, there was a law from a previous pope that said that you could actually confiscate the, the homes from nearby yours if you were building a palace. And so that's what she did. She set out to build a beautiful palace that was worth, worth of a pipe. She got all the best artists of the place. This is part of the palace, as you can see it right now. Um, it's called Palazzo Panfili, clearly, and it's got a throne room inside because every palace of a family of a pope could have a throne room in, uh, inside. And... Um, but now you cannot, you can hardly ever visit it. It's, you can do it, but it's really rare that it's open because it's now the Brazilian embassy. Once she set out to redo her beautiful palace, she thought she needed to give a better touch to her front garden. So Don Olympia had now a palace suitable for a Pope King, and she thought of decorating her front yard. That was Piazza Navona. So she chose Rome's best artist to um, redo the fountain for the piazza. His name was Gian Lorenzo Bernini. This is Gian Lorenzo. You will find his work all around Rome and you know him already, even if you don't know. Let's see. He was one of the artists who made Rome as we know it. You find his work all around town. He was a great storyteller in marble. It was mainly a sculpture. But then we also became an architect and a painter. And he loves theatricals mise-en-scene um, to tell stories. So every time you see one of the works of Bernini, think of a theatre. And uh, you will see all the different elements that he gathers to tell you the story just in a snapshot. He was already very famous at the time Don Olympia asked him to build a fountain. But let's see what happened. You know him already, I'll show you why. He was the pet artist of the previous Pope, which meant there was a conflict with Pope Innocent X. And he was in mighty disgrace at the time. He'd done something terrible. What was it? Let's see. Something you already know Bernini for. Where are we? That's the Vatican. That's St. Peter's with the square. So Bernini is the one who designed St. Peter's squares and the colonnade that is like hugging all of the uh, faithful. You can see it here as well. But at that time, at the time of Don Olympia, the colonnade of St. Peter's did not exist yet. Not until the next Pope, he was called Alexander VII of a family called Kiji. We're going to see about that in another module. So why was he in disgrace? What had he done that was so terrible? Have a look. Tell me what is missing on St. Peter's. Most other churches have got it, but St. Peter's doesn't. What is it? What are they? Or what is it? Yeah, the bell towers. So Bernini built the bell towers. This is a rendition. We do not have any images. Um, or I couldn't find any that I could show you. But what happened? They cracked the facade of St. Peter's. Can you imagine something you do cracking the facade of St. Peter's? Imagine being the Pope. How would you have felt? What would you have done? 
Pope Innocent X was furious. He took Bernini off working on St. Peter's. Major disaster. Imagine how Bernini must have felt. In truth, it was not Bernini's fault. The previous architect had messed up the foundations and Bernini had to prove everyone it was still great. How could he do that? So let's see how he went from disgrace to new glory. Bernini managed to let Innocent X see a model of his project for the fountain in Piazza Navona. Possibly the story goes that he gave Donna Olimpia, the Pope's sister-in-law and advisor, a solid silver model of the fountain as a gift. Bribery, anyone? Innocent could not refuse him after he saw Bernini's majestic and original project because it was just so much better than any of the other projects he's seen to that point. This is the result, a beautiful fountain, a very theatrical one. So what does the fountain actually say to you? Well, this is a story told by the fountain. God, which is represented by the obelisk, which in antiquity was uh, represented the cult of the sun, but also represents the Pope, because as we have seen up at the top, you find the dove with the olive branch of which is the family coat of the Pamphili family of the Pope. So God and the Pope reign over the four continents. How do we know that? So there are four men on the fountain, on the four corners, and each one of them represents the main river of a continent, the Danube, the Nile, the Mississippi, and the Rio de la Plata. You can see the family crest with the, the cross, the keys of heaven and the tiara of the uh, earthly power of the Pope. And right next to it, there is one figure. That one is the closest to the Pope, which is the river Danube, which represents Europe. The one with a huge big horror is the navigable Ganges. So you can actually row on the Gange and uh, you can uh, go up and down it. Um, the wealthy Rio de la Plata, because there was a lot of gold in America and that's how they thought of representing it. If you can see down at the bottom of the personification of the Rio de la Plata, you can see lots of coins. Then there is a river whose head source were not yet known, the Nile. They hadn't yet found the sources of the Nile, and that's why you see his head covered up. But Bernini wanted to show the world that he's still a great architect, that he was still a great architect. And so, if you, have, you can look through the fountain, uh, there is a big hole, and he wanted to show everyone that he could put the immense weight of an obelisk and let it stand on thin air. And that is one of the main features of the fountain. Um, a lot of people thought that the obelisk would fall. And so in a quite theatrical uh, scene, Bernini just went and tied little ropes to the top of the obelisk and tied it to four buildings on the square. Clearly the little ropes were not going to keep up the obelisk. Um, but that made everybody understand that really that obelisk did not need anything to keep up. So what's the irony of this? Well, the irony is that although the fountain proclaims the power of the Pope over the world, at the time the Pope was actually losing political power. At a time, especially because of the unruly behaviour of France. What do I mean by that? So this fountain says to everybody, Pope Innocent X is so powerful, he rules over the earth and over the fourth con four continents. But really at the time, the Thirty Years' War was on. And the Thirty Years' War started as Catholics in the south, south of countries, versus Protestants, mostly northern countries. 
um, the Catholics included the Empire, which is pretty much Germany as well. So Spain, France, Germany, Italy, although it was not Italy at the time. Naughty France, what did they do wrong, according to the Pope? Well, France, to counter his neighbour, the Empire, Germany, switched the sides and made an alliance with the Protestants, with Sweden, against the Catholic coalition, which changed the old frame of the war. Imagine the frustration of Innocent X. France's switch in alliances changed the war from one of religion, where the Pope was the head of the coalition, to one of power, where the Pope was just a pawn. Did the people of Rome like the Fountain of the Rivers when it was first made? Well, at the time there was a big famine in Rome and Romans desperately needed an asta for a bread. How would you have felt if you had been starving, a starving Roman and the money to help you in subsidies for grains went into building a beautiful fountain? Innocent X lost consensus from the people of Rome. So there was also his fading personal power. No matter how powerful the Fountain of Rivers describes the Pope, when his Innocent X died, no one wanted to pay for his funeral. His body laid in the Vatican for a few days. Not Don Olympia, his sister-in-law, who is said to have pinched two coffers of solid gold um, from his room just before he died. Not her children, his nephews, of one of whom Camillo had been at one time Innocent's cardinal nephew, which means prime minister, and certainly not the people of Rome, wanted to pay for his funeral. In the end, the people working for him gave him a coffin and buried it inside the Vatican. Later on, Camillo actually moved his uh, uh, uncle's body to the church that I will show you in a minute. But at the time, not much loved at all. We gained a masterpiece with the fountain. We'll go there from the four corners of the world and go and see it and take pictures and selfies with it. And we are oblivious to the suffering it created. And we will forever be grateful to Innocent X for his legacy. And we still love the fountain and the square. What could Don Olympia do after she's done her palace? And she'd done her front yard. Well, how about a beautiful church on the square? And that is just what she did. Sant'Agnes Sinagone is the beautiful square that Don Olympia and Pope Innocent X commissioned uh, an artist called the Borromini. And it's a beautiful Baroque church where now Innocent X lies. This is one of the best examples of um, Roman Baroque. So it was a family church, Don Olympia and Innocent X engaged star artist Borromini to finish the family complex of palace, square and church by upgrading a very old church that had been there since the 4th century um, that was dedicated to St. Agnes. St. Agnes became a masterpiece of Baroque architecture and now hosts the remains of Innocent X. But how was Piazza Navone in ancient Roman times? You know that already from module number one. It was the ancient stadium of Domitian. So when you go and see the, the square, you have to imagine placing your bets before the races and cashing in afterwards. You have to imagine climbing up the steps to watch the races and buying snacks from the many loud vendors, like going to the stadium today. You have to imagine using the services of or being a prostitute in the archives. We can still the, see the price lists in the graffiti on the arches. And you should also imagine being an athlete in the stadium, focusing on the race amongst the roaring crowds could you imagine being Domitian, the emperor himself? How can you do that? I'll tell you a couple of 
little stories about the missions and you will just have to remember that the next time you go to Piazza Navona. So what about Domitian's family? He was part of the Flavian dynasty. The Flavians took power in the second part of the first century AD. So first century, second part, just after Nero's death, soon after Nero's death. Domitian's dad, Vespasian, and his big brother, Titus, were both emperors before Domitian. They legitimized their family power with the military victories over Judea and Jerusalem, which Titus conquered. So because it was a new dynasty, it was not any longer the one of Augustus and Claudius. It was a new dynasty. So they had to legitimize their power with a, uh, with a war, with a victory. And so they did. Titus, while his uh, father was emperor, went off to Judea and uh, you can see the, the story of it on the Arch of Titus, on the celebratory Arch of Titus, which also served as the tomb for both Titus and Vespasian, and that is in the Roman Forum on the Palatine Hill. So, they both, uh, both Vespasian and Titus, wanted to get away from Nero. Nero was not well seen, was not a good example, and they wanted to be seen closer to Augustus. So the Flavians used the propaganda to distance themselves from Nero, who was loathed by the people, and to show themselves closer to Claudius and Augustus, who were loved by the people. How did they do that? Giving to the people. So Vespasian and Titus both set out to give back to the people of Rome a huge, massive area that Nero confiscated to make his massive golden house, the Domus Aurea. What did Vespasian, the mission's dead, build for the masses? <laughs> you know already, but if you don't, I will give you a hint, shall we? This is what Vespasian's, the mission's dead, built. The Flavian Amphitheatre that you all know under the name of Colosseum. That was a very hard act to follow for Domitian. Vespasian built the Colosseum on top of Nero's man-made lake. He had his engineers create a lake for his golden home. And uh, Vespasian also created the Forum Pacis uh, of Peace that was right next, uh, uh, almost next, uh, there was a, a street in between, the Forum of Augustus. And Titus built his public baths close to the part of the Domus area which is still standing. So you can not any longer see uh, the baths of Titus. They are on a hill that is called Oppian Hill, called Leopio. But you can still go and see part of the Domus Aurea. When um, Nero died, the Domus Aurea was partly destroyed, but partly filled in with uh, earth to create the foundations for the baths of Trajan, which were built on top. So now you can, um, you have to book in advance, but you can put a helmet on and you co can go down underground right next to the Colosseum and go and visit Nero's home. Now, if you've been Domitian, if your dad has built the Colosseum, how do you stand a chance of being more popular than him? What can you do? So Domitian focused on both public and private architecture. He did focus on the public, although he's more famous for his private architecture. So he gave the Roman the stadium under Piazza Navona and an Odeon, which was a beautiful theater nearby. So when they had the games in the stadium of Domitian on Piazza Navona, they also had intellectual competitions in this big theatre called the Odeon. And also he built the Forum of Nerva, but why do they call it the Forum of Nerva and not the Forum of Domitian? We'll see. And he focused on the architecture of the Imperial Palace on the Palatine Hill. Now, Domitian's reign was 15 years of enlightened autocracy, laying the foundation for the second century peace. Was it? Or was it tyranny? Who do we consider to be the judge? Well, 
If we consider the judge to be the Senate, at the time the Senate had some pretty interesting powers. It could make somebody a god, which is called divinization, or they could erase somebody from public memory, which was called the damnatio memoria, which meant that uh, all their heads were uh, torn off from the statu statues, uh, their faces in paintings were erased, uh, um, so that the memory of this person would not be there any longer. So, for example, Augustus was made a god, but Nero was declared the enemy of the state. Although he really never formally received a damnatio memoria, the effects were similar. Both Vespasian and Titus, so the father and the brother of Domitian, became gods. They were made gods by the Senate. That was a hard act to follow. Do you think Domitian became a god? Let's see what he did. Imagine yourself being Domitian. Your dad built the Colosseum. Your brother won battles and legitimized your dynasty. They both are gods. How do you feel? He made himself a god without the help of the Senate. With a father and a brother already gods, Domitian named himself Dominus et Deus, Lord and God, while he was still alive. He took power away from the Senate and ruled a sort of divine monarchy. So when he died, did the Senate proclaim, or rather confirm him as a god? What do you reckon? And the answer is no. Domitian was issued by the Senate of Damnatio Memoriae. His memory was erased from the city, and that's why the Forum of Domitian is not called the Forum of Domitian, it's called the Forum of Nerva, the next emperor. Yet, notwithstanding the fact that he was not a god, and or at least a god by the Senate, he was a god by himself, and notwithstanding the Damnatio Memoriae, we ultimately have to thank Domitian for our much-loved Piazza Navona. So, we saw how to do time travel. You need to know stories and you need your empathy. The aim of time traveling is to bring Rome's history to life. You need to feel the joys, the trials and tribulations of the people of Rome and partake of the stories. The knowledge of the stories is easy. You can get through my courses, through books, on Google, the most important tool that you need to develop is your own empathy and imagination for putting yourself in their shoes. Otherwise, the places you go and visit will be dry and will not mean anything to you. So the next time you're in Rome, in Piazza Navona, this is the complex of the Panfili family built by Don Olimpia and Innocent X. You can see the palace to the left in the middle uh, and to the very right in the middle you can see the church of saint agnes and you can see in front of the fountain by bernini so all of this was built by the power of a very wealthy and resourceful woman called don olympia and by the pope her brother-in-law innocent the tenth Without them, we couldn't have all of these masterpieces and all the masterpieces you can see inside them. So I want you to sit on a bench when you're there and visualize going to the Befana market as a kid, playing or being seen in the summer lake as a kid or as a noble person, running a fruit and veggie market stall, jousting against the Saracen dummy with a cat of nine tails, being Don Olympia and climbing the social ladder, being Innocent the Tenth and seeking glorification but losing power, and I also want you to visualize being Bernini in disgrace because his uh, bell towers as have cracked the facade of St. Peter's, but providing himself, proving himself to the world again with a masterpiece, his beautiful fountain. I want you to imagine being an athlete competing in the stadium or a spectators on the bleachers 
a street vendor or a prostitute in the arcades of the stadium. They want you to imagine being Emperor Domitian himself, in the shadows of his brother Titus and his father Vespasian at first, and then blossoming into an autocrat loved by the people but despised by the Senate. If you do that, rather than just looking around and taking pictures and having an ice cream, your experience will be truly amazing. This is what we covered in this video. We, why we need to time travel in Rome, how to time travel, and time traveling in Piazza Navona. In the next video, we're going to time travel in and around Piazza Venezia, and we're going to explore a lot of life, both private and public, upper class a lower class, a lot of destruction and triumph. So I'll see you there. From your Roman consul, Maria Cristina Saraceno, till next time. Bye!